So welcome everyone. You are now in the webinar. Glad you can, could make it today. Uh, our webinar topic is three steps to banish bad business meetings. Um, this is the third in a series and this is going to be the best because we've been practicing a lot. <laughs> so your hosts today are going to be Elise Keith. Uh, she is the co-founder of Lucid Meetings and the author of Where the Action Is, uh, The Meetings That Make or Break Your Organization. Uh, I am Trisha Harris. I'm also one of the hosts. I'm the product evangelist here at Lucid Meetings, and I'll be keeping us on track today. So a little housekeeping. Before we begin, we'll have a 50-minute presentation followed by a Q&A session. Um, but I encourage you to use the questions box whenever you like and, uh, you know, also feel free to use the chat as many of you already have. Um, so it looks like everything's working. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Elise. All right, thank you, Tricia. I am so excited that all of you have come here today. Um, as Tricia said, I'm Elise Keith. I'm the founder of Lucid Meetings and the author of Where the Action Is, the meetings that make or break your organization and a true meeting enthusiast. Um, now meetings are just something that everyone does. No one seems to like, or at least they don't claim they like them, and not very many people take seriously. And that's an opportunity. So how you can seize that opportunity, the proven three-step process that we use with our clients to help them transform their meetings from a source of pain and frustration into a competitive advantage, that's what we're gonna cover here today. So since the release of my book, um, I have been known in the popular press as the meeting maven, which is fabulous and weird, but I certainly wasn't born with an enthusiasm for meetings. For me, my journey began one day when I realized there was no way out. It was a beautiful, sunny spring day. The rain had finally stopped and anyone who was anyone in the seventh grade was headed to the park to go, well, it wasn't super clear what we were going to do, but what I did know was that the boy I had a mad crush on was going to be there. And I thought, for sure, if I could get there, this was my opportunity for that first kiss. But I was stuck inside cleaning my mother's stupid bathtub, which was infuriating. I was livid. I was fuming. And as I was standing there in her bathtub, just seething and gripping those scrubbing bubbles in the dish rag and trying to figure out how to get out, it occurred to me, there was no way out. All I had to convince my mom of the futility of cleaning her bathtub and my need to get out there were words. And that wasn't going to work. There were no words that I could use that would show my mom. And I realized in that moment that I could use to show anyone what was really in my soul and my heart. At that moment, it was the first time in my life that I realized in this way, we are all truly alone. And I dissolved. I just fell into that grubby bathtub and I sobbed. After that, I grew up and I joined the business world. But that didn't change my interest in trying to get out there in trying to be part of something that was bigger and cooler, right? It just changed the kinds of groups and the kinds of things that I thought were cool. And yet in the business world, I noticed that we all spend a lot of time using words at each other in meetings. Now, usually in our business meetings, we're not really trying to reveal our souls to one another, but we do want to be together. We do want to be heard and just a little bit less alone. And yet, as I matured in my career, I would look around and I would notice that a lot of us 
deep down inside are really sort of 12 year old girls sobbing in a bathtub. You know, we're bored, we're frustrated, we'd rather be out playing, and we have no idea how to get out of the terrible meetings we're in. There are a lot of bad meetings out there. But did you know that not only do these meetings waste time, they kill our ability to make decisions and close sales. Did you know that bad meetings um, are attended up to 80% of the time that an executive spends at a workday, and yet very few of them have any training whatsoever in how to make those meetings run well? And did you know that um, recent research has actually found out that bad meetings, when chronic, are a leading cause of employee disengagement, greatly increasing the odds that those employees will quit, just like they did for me early in my career. One day, I found myself sitting at the back of the room, watching the CEO pointlessly explain yet another variation of a strategy that everyone knew would never get implemented. And I had this perfect view of the VPs of sales and product as they glared at each other and completely ignored what the CEO was saying. But yet that time, I was ecstatic. I was jubilant because I had found the way out. As soon as that meeting was over, I quit that job. Bad meetings turn our employees into frustrated preteens seeking an escape, which I know and you know we all know this because we have all lived it. But can you imagine what it would be like if you knew your meetings would lead to quality decisions? Can you imagine what it would be like if you knew that your meetings with clients at, would advance those relationships and help you make more money? And can you imagine what it would be like if your meetings energized your team rather than drug them down? And not just like every once in a while as a fluke, but like as a regular course of habit. Well, you're not going to have to imagine for long because I'm going to teach you exactly how to do this. Because I believe that intentionally designing how you use your meetings is the most efficient, and approachable way to design success into your business. In the last eight years, our team has worked with thousands of companies just like yours to help them reform how they're going to use their meetings. So whether you are brand new to leading meetings or have been leading meetings for years, or even for those of you coaches and facilitators who help other people run better meetings, I promise that you will find at least one new idea in this webinar that you can put to use right away. So with that, let's take a look at the agenda. Share my desktop and get all of these things to go away, go away and find my presentation. Okay. All right. So this is what we call a visual agenda. This is a technique that in-person teams use, often using sticky notes to help them keep track of the agenda and keep the discussion going. Um, here's how it works. Please feel free to adopt this. It's really simple, it's really effective. This is one of your first practical takeaways. So there are three columns, as I mentioned. Right now we are doing the intro. So we're going to move that to the intro, into the doing phase. And then after that, we will go through the three steps. Step one, banish bad meetings. Step two, get a meeting game plan. And step three, play to win. And I'll explain each of these as we get to it. And then finally, we'll have some time at the end for QA and wrap up. All right, everyone clear on what's going to happen here? All right, let's move on. Let's get the intro into the done column and get started with step one, banish bad meetings. All right, who here knows the law of holes? It basically goes like this. When you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Fair enough. 
So the first step is to stop holding worthless meetings. Easier said than done, let's take a look at what that means. In the business context, we have really good news on this front because in a business context, um, meetings are a tool. And as such, there are really only two qualities you need to keep in mind to make them effective. First, they need to have high PMQ and then NPI. That's what we use for an effective meeting. PMQ stands for perceived meeting quality and NPI is net positive impact. Now, both of these acronyms come from the research, but don't worry, you don't need to memorize the acronyms. I mean, unless you are studying to be an IO psychologist, in which case you might as well, but um, you do need to understand the underlying concepts. So let's explore each of those in turn. First, perceived meeting quality. This is all about how people feel in the meeting, whether or not they felt like that meeting was a good use of their time. And to help explore this concept, I'm gonna share a short case study because we're all really very good at detecting when a meeting doesn't feel well, but not quite as great about being clear about how to fix that. So I'd like to tell you about Sally. Sally's a small business owner who came to us about a year ago for help. Sally's not her real name. Now, Sally is brilliant. She's amazing. Sally uh, is one of the top three professionals in what she does. It's a very specialized kind of construction in the world. So after decades of working for other people, she went off and she created her own company. And because, like I said, Sally is truly amazing, she was pretty instantly flooded with customers. Wonderful problem to have, right? So she hired a team, a little bit overwhelmed, a little bit excited, and they got to work. But things weren't going so well. She was starting to get complaints about her project leads. So Sally gave me a call. And she said, Elise, the project leads don't know how to run meetings with clients. They're showing up unprepared. So when the client asks them for progress on a project, the project leads are kind of fumbling all over themselves. They don't really have anything great to say. And my clients are getting really, really frustrated. So I asked her how she knew this. I thought maybe she was getting complaints and it turned out no, she knew this because she was sitting in on many of these meetings, not because she was involved in the products, projects directly, but because the client was bringing their team to the meetings. So she felt it was important that she brought her team to the meetings as well so that they all looked like they were balanced which has created this situation where there are these large group of people representing both groups, all pointing the fingers at the product lead and Sally's starting to really freak out and she says, ah, at least get this man an agenda. Okay, so this is obviously not a great situation, not a good meeting. Let's look at what the concept and the research around perceived meeting quality can tell us that we might use to help this situation. So high perceived meeting quality, just to recap, this is the feeling you have after participating, participating is key, in a high quality meeting. Now in 2011, there was a research group that looked specifically at like what characteristics, what exactly do you need to have a high quality meeting? And they looked at the best practice research out there. Now, other experts are going to tell you that to lead good meetings, you need to keep them short. You need an agenda. Certainly, this is what Sally wanted for her project lead, an agenda. You need to minimize the number of meetings. We just shouldn't be spending time in all of these waste of time meetings. And fewer people. Get that number down. Now, as you might guess from the setup, I'm going to tell you something different. Short actually isn't the goal. The real goal, and this was backed up by the research, is on time. That meeting needs to start on time and end on time. Um, short or long, either way, equally possible to have excellent meetings. You certainly don't want to have a strategic planning session that goes too short. An agenda, again, not required. An agenda is a fabulous tool, but what's actually required is clarity of purpose and clarity about the kind of result you're trying to achieve. 
An agenda is one way that you can communicate that in advance and use to help get everybody along, but it's certainly not the only way. And in some cases, it's, it's um, completely misused. Minimizing the number of meetings. Seems like good advice. It's actually off target. It has, the number of meetings is not the point at all. What you need to watch is the interruptions. Instead of worrying about how many meetings people are in, you need to worry about how much time they have to do the detailed focus work they need to get their jobs done. And then finally, this last one, fewer people. That again is a little bit off base. Certainly would help in the case of Sally's meetings, but actually what matters is relevant people. Because the key to success is that you have people participating, which means that meeting needs to be relevant to what they're doing, needs to be something they care about and something that they have input into. And if you take all of that and you kind of sum it up, it really looks like this. For a quality meeting, you need to set and meet expectations. Okay, so it's not so much about keeping meetings short or having an agenda. It's really about having clarity of purpose, having a structure that supports that purpose, keeping the meeting on time, and then getting some results at the end. Purpose. This is one of your another practical tips. This is typically stated as a verb. It's the reason why you're meeting, to make a decision, to check progress, to update the plan, to interview a candidate. Why stated as a verb. You want to state this up front before the meeting begins so that when people come to your meeting, they can see that it's relevant for them. They have a chance of understanding why they want to be there and why they might participate. In Sally's case, we were able to find that, right? It's a project update meeting. They generally all have the same kind of purpose to check project progress, resolve issues, and update the project plan. Okay, so knowing that purpose, stating that, they were able to let the irrelevant people go. They were in a better position to feel good, to have high meeting quality. But you know, feeling like the meeting was a good use of time really isn't enough. For an effective meeting, it also needs to have a net positive impact. It needs to give something back. It needs to create more goodwill, more results, more energy than it took out and leave the group in a better place than it was before. So most project leads understand that their client wants to know what's going on with the project. And when Sally came, she was very focused on finding an agenda for this specific meeting. But an agenda wasn't really the reason that the project lead wasn't able to tell their client what was going on with the project. They were fumbling because they lacked information. So I asked Sally, I said, Sally, what's going on with the rest of your meetings? Because usually the way it works is that these project meetings where the project lead and the client come together are backed up by a whole series of meetings each team is having internally. And on Sally's team's side, you know, every one of those meetings takes that ball from the initial promise that they've made that customer and advances it so that by the time the project lead and the client get together, yay, they can hand them the happy ball of progress. Obviously, that wasn't happening in this case. So, what was happening? Well, it's very possible, and I asked about this, um, that their meetings were too many that they were having way too many team meetings. My computer is totally frozen. Yay. But of course that wasn't the case. They weren't having too many meetings. What had happened instead was that Sally, because she had been going to all of these project team meetings, had actually canceled all of their team meetings so that when the project lead got in with the client, they had nothing to report. So let's talk about NPI and that problem. NPI is all about the results. What do you get at the end of the meeting? 
Um, in the case when you're setting up your agenda, you're going to state that as your desired outcomes. These are nouns. They are the what you get. So it will be a list. It will be solutions to our issues. It will be an action plan. If Sally had understood the desired outcomes for all of those team meetings, she would have seen how they chain together and lead to the success for the project lead in the middle um, and, and would not have canceled them all. Okay, so NPI means you get outcomes that move the ball forward. And that's really what we're looking for. So getting back to our first step, our first step is banish bad meetings. When you've got clarity of purpose and a way for people to participate resulting in tangible outcomes, that's it. So now that we've got that established, we can spot the madness and stop the madness. Any meeting you're having right now that lacks these qualities, that doesn't have purpose and desired outcomes, verbs and nouns, or that includes too many people that aren't relevant to that meeting needs to be canceled or fixed. So how do you do that? Well, when we work one-on-one -on -one with clients, we typically start by listing all of their meetings in a spreadsheet and looking specifically for these qualities. Here is an example worksheet from one of our training courses. And you basically, you just list the meetings and how many people are in them and all of these things. And when you do that, it becomes really obvious where you're doing some hole digging. So for example, when you look at the people and the duration, you see what that investment is. You know, are you putting in more than what you're getting out? If you look at the purpose, can you even articulate it? Super important to know. And then finally, we look at what part of the business does that meeting serve? And knowing that also helps you see, you know, is this relevant to my business priorities or is this something that's just entirely off base? Now, often when we look at these with the client, they will look at all the meetings on their calendar and go, oh my gosh, you know, these these are too expensive, there are too many irrelevant people, I'm not even sure why we're doing this. And they'll call and they'll say, you know, Elise, ah, there are terrible meetings everywhere, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna cancel them. I'm just gonna cancel them all. Which is why it's incredibly important to move directly from step one, banish bad meetings, into step two. And my presentation is frozen again, so let's go ahead and move to step two very, very aggressively and manually. Step two, get a meeting game plan. All right, so a question to consider. If your meeting is absolutely full, if your company is absolutely full of terrible meetings, why not cancel them all? Why do we need meetings in our business? Oftentimes people will say that it's because we need to make decisions. We need to keep that ball moving forward. All of these things, you know, and certainly it is all of those kinds of reasons. Um, you know, when we first started working with clients, we used to call this step laying a foundation, uh, but we changed it to get in the game because laying the foundation in, while wonderfully solid implied the idea that we were creating something that never changed. And yet, that's just wrong for meetings um, because, you know, we work in organizations. Like how many of you work at a company that does the same thing it did when it was founded? Or where your plans that you make on day one always work out? It's not really our reality. Organizations bring people together in pursuit of a goal. But the reality is not organization. The reality is organizing. So in step two, what we're doing here is we're working to find out how to use our meetings, not just how to run a good meeting, but how to use our meetings to achieve our business goals. All right, which means at this point, we start talking to clients about how to develop their meeting operating system. Now I know meeting operating system sounds like software, it's not. This is a system that is used by companies to ensure that their meetings are effective and aligned with the needs of the business. And it has three components. One, performance criteria. Two, operating models. And I'll explain both of these in more detail in a second. And then three, support. And support includes 
all of the training and the technology and the conference rooms and the things you need to make the kinds of meetings you run work well. And the support becomes pretty obvious once you figure out what those meetings ought to be. But the first two, performance criteria and operating models, require design. Let's start with performance criteria. Performance criteria are the rules of the game as it is played in your organization. When it comes to meetings, who are the players? What are the roles? What's out of bounds? What are the goals? What are some of our criteria for success? To help explain this a bit, let's take a look at some examples. Amazon. Amazon is fairly famous for two of their performance criteria for meetings. One, no PowerPoint. And two, the two pizza rule. These are their ways of trying to keep conversations more engaged and meeting size small. Google. Google at one point had a rule that I think is quite awesome, that there had to be a 10 minute gap between every meeting so that people had an opportunity, as they said, everyone deserves a chance to pee. So fabulous, 10 minute break between meetings, mandatory. Apple. Apple ends every meeting by ensuring every task has a DRI, a directly responsible individual. It's their way of making sure that meetings end with tasks where they can be held accountable to their achievement in their next meeting. So this is what performance criteria look like. If you don't have any in your company yet, and you've looked at the banish bad meetings step, an easy place and a fairly obvious place to start that we might suggest is every meeting invite must include the meeting purpose and desired outcomes. So performance criteria, step part one of a meeting operating system. Part two, the meeting operating models. Now these are the plays. These are the ways that you use specific meetings together to achieve goals. All right, so um, as your team matures, you might end up with a whole bunch of different operating models. For example, you will have a series of meetings that you use to get a client project started, managed, and delivered. You'd have one for interviewing. You might have one for sales, um, all kinds of things. So most organizations, when we begin this work, have a few of these in place already. And part of the work is to find those plays, the existing plays, bring them out into the open, get them to match the uh, performance criteria, and then fill in any gaps. Let's take a look at an example so you kind of get a sense of what I'm talking about. This is a meeting flow model for scoping a custom program. Uh, this is one that we actually use in our own business when we're going to do a larger training, uh, custom training program, or some kind of sort of longer engagement with a client. We begin with a workshop. The workshop's job is to get the teams to know each other and to make sure that everybody has the shared context around what we're going to do in that program. 75 minutes, we look at goals, we look at constraints, risks, get the shared view. Then, if the project warrants it, We'll hold a brainstorming session separately to explore and explode all of the different ways in which we might make this project really cool. Now, I personally am not a huge fan of um, in-person real-time brainstorming unless I also need to make it for team building, so we'll often do that online. But most importantly, the planning meeting. The planning meeting is separate, and it's a place where we and our clients will co-create that plan. Because, um, is it, Helmut von Moltke, as he says, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. I would say that today, pretty much no plan survives contact with reality. But when you plan together, everybody has a sense of not only what that plan is and why it is, but also what other options you considered that you might try when things go awry and what was really important and what can bend. So you work the plan together, you and your client, you and your team, as many people who are gonna be involved as possible. The result of the planning meeting is the plan, which then you take to a formal decision-making meeting. This is a checkoff where you get the signature. So this is our process, our meeting flow model for 
starting a conversation with a client about a program and getting it signed and put into reality. Do so you see how that works? Does that make sense? Um, I'll definitely take questions about this when we get a little farther. So again, as I said, most organizations have some of this, not all of it. And as you can imagine, this can be a great big task. This can be, in fact, the work of years. You'll always be finding new meetings that you want to outline and design. So the most important part to get right, right up front, is to make sure that the organization has a core meeting flow model, an operational meeting flow model that keeps the strategy right in front and center and make sure that strategy gets executed. And that looks something like this. So you have strategic planning, and then you don't put that strategic plan on the shelf. You use that workshop to seed, to seed the conversation in your daily check-ins and in your weekly check-ins where you're looking at metrics against the strategic plan. These teams also will set up a dedicated once per month decision-making meeting because they know there's going to be something that will come up that means their strategy needs to shift and they reserve that time to make a high quality decision at least once a month. And then finally, because the cadence of our world is so very, very quick and because we all forget what we decided before, Every 90 days, you pull that strategy back out and you make sure it's refreshed. So to give you a sense of how this works in practice, we had um, work with an Australian government agency actually last spring and we helped them put this model in place. Um, and when we began, the director called me and she said, hey, my team is working together in meetings at three hours a week and we're going nowhere. You know, our conversations are going in circles, our decisions never seem to stick, and you know, we're starting to get defeated. So she had this really well-meaning, fabulous, excited team and a terrible, ineffective meeting habit. And we helped them put this model in place. And I got this email from her uh, three months later. She said they, the guidance had an incredible impact on the team's productivity, they resolve problems in real time, they keep themselves connected. And then, you know, I thought most importantly, teasing operations and strategy discussions apart as a game changer. So that having a model like this really truly can be a game changer. It's an amazingly transformational system to put in place. Of course, not every client we work with even has a strategy. So for them, um, we start here. If you have nothing, you start here. Getting this one meeting right will make everything else go well. So getting your weekly team meeting. Now, I know this meeting has a bad reputation, but getting that one right keeps the team intact. It makes sure that you keep moving forward and it gives you time to keep things rolling while you figure out everything else. Uh, we had another call from actually an international bank, um, as a team within an international bank, which much to my surprise had nothing. They had nothing. And we helped them put this meeting in place. And um, they said, yes, the format had been really helpful and it kept them more focused and productive, where before they were an unbearable waste of time. So not quite as glowing, but absolutely still a desirable outcome, a great place to start. All right. So. We talked about step one, where we banish bad meetings, we stop digging. So again, if you have any meetings that lack purpose or desired outcomes, fix that now. Now we've finished talking about step two, where you start to then implement performance criteria and de design the specific sequences or flow models of meetings you use to keep your company running and achieve your goals. And that's all great. It's really great, of course. So once you have that in place, then you can start looking at playing to win. Because you know, having effective meetings, that's wonderful and all, but nobody wakes up in the morning like saying, hey, I'm gonna spend my day effectively, you know, right? We, it's, not, it's not inspiring. So this part is where we get to ha start having some fun. Playing to win, it has two components. First, you work on optimizing your performance. And second, you work on optimizing your culture. Optimizing performance, what might that look like? 
Well, if you're a company that needs to improve your innovation, you might get some better brainstorming techniques, right? Improve uh, the number of ideas you can generate in any meeting, you know, change your design thinking methods. If you're a company that's like dealing with huge market sort of shifts, you might embrace some techniques that are about navigating complexity that help you design projects and portfolios that mitigate risk and chances of failure. And finally, if your performance is anemic, you would start to explore some interesting ways to go about making decisions. There are fabulous models for doing sense making and um, interesting decision uh, profiling that really dramatically increase the quality and the velocity of the decisions that you make within your company. Really cool stuff. You can't do this if you're having lousy meetings with disengaged people. So if that's you, start back at step one and just know that there is this world of wonderful, rich stuff to explore once you get your foundations in place. So that's performance optimization. Performance optimization is all about playing to win, more winning. The other part, cultural optimization, is about more playing. So let's talk about some examples with that one. Amazon. Remember Amazon's performance criteria? They have a rule that basically says no more than eight people per meeting. But they didn't call it that, right? They called it the two pizza rule, the two large pizza rule. Performance, uh, cultural ownership of your meetings means you bring in your own language and your own flair to how you run the conversations. The two pizza rule means no more than eight people per meeting, but it tells you something about Amazon. It tells you that they're interested in youth, in energy, in pizza. Starbucks has a beautiful ritual. They begin many meetings at their corporate headquarters with a coffee tasting. This helps them understand the product that they're selling to their customers. It also taps into the wonderful rich rituals we have as a species around the sharing of food that connote comfort and care, care for one another. Um, another research tip, just by the by, they have found that if you really want to make people happy at meetings, bring snacks. So coffee tasting, very specific to Starbucks, works very nicely. Zingerman's, uh, I had the opportunity to visit Zingerman's and observe their meetings as I was writing my book. Um, and they have like 20 different companies, all different sizes, some small teams, some large teams, all of whom run a weekly huddle. It's a, a long form meeting where they review their books. And in every single instance, they begin that meeting with an icebreaker. Now, the icebreakers are chosen each week by whoever happens to be leading. I sat in one with a team of 30, and the icebreaker was, you know, do you predict it will snow again this spring? And yeah, as they went around the room, a lot of people were like, no, because they had dates or they, you know, really didn't want it to. Uh, and others were like, well, yes, I'm sure it will snow because that's just my luck. And you know, we didn't matter what they said. What we had, what we saw happen was that everyone shared something about who they were. They laughed, they expressed sympathy, they got to know each other, and they worked better as a team. There is a research group um, led by Michael Norton out of HBR that has found that when you do these kinds of things, team performance improves. It's causally related and it's clear. We're also seeing a rise in teams that begin their meetings with a moment of silence or even meditation. So cultural ownership, this is where we take our meetings and we make them an expression of our values and who we want to be as a company. Okay, so those are the three steps. So let's look at how these play out over time. Step one, banish bad meetings. You can start that right now. And depending on how much time and how many meetings you've got on your calendar, that can take up to 30 days. But it really shouldn't take longer than that because this is all about stopping things. And I know the webinar is called Banish Bad Meetings and there are then three steps for it. That's because if you just stop something and you don't replace it with something else, it'll just come right back. So it's important to get right on to step two, which is to get a meeting game plan. 
establish some simple performance criteria and some base meeting flow models. This is gonna take at least three months to get through that first sequence of flows before you start to feel like you've got an idea on it and maybe up to 12 months. And like I said, actually this step is ongoing. This will go on forever, but at one point, somewhere between three and 12 months, it will stop being an intervention and it will become a capability. It will become part of how your company operates. Now, you don't have to have that done before you can start experimenting with things like icebreakers, but you're not gonna put a huge amount of focus on that until you have some of your bases in place. So that's it. Those are our three steps. Stop bad meetings, get in the game, play to win. And with that, I'm ready for a sip of water and to answer any questions. Trisha, do we have any questions? We do not yet, but I would love to hear some. <laughs> wow, that makes that easy, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. So um, one of the questions I was asked last time was if, uh, if you wanted to explore more of these ideas in greater detail, is that information in the book? A lot of it certainly is. A lot of it is also available on our website. We have free um, templates and models that you can download. The leadership sequence that I showed, that's a blog post and that all of the templates for running a flow like that are available as free downloads on our website as well. Any other questions beyond the question that I just asked myself? <laughs> <laughs> Could you turn that video on, please? I can make you the host. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, so we do have a few questions coming in now. And you guys are welcome to use the Q&A box or you're welcome to use the, the chat, whatever's easiest. Um, so just to clarify, this is from Melanie. Does the outcome of a meeting need to be actionable? Uh, for example, disqualifying meetings intended to share informati information. Um, the, it sh the outcome from a meeting should lead to some, you should be something you can then put to use in the business, right? There are occasions where an information sharing meeting is warranted, but it's a very special kind of meeting and it's absolutely the lowest engagement. So, um, you know, that's really something you want to reserve for your broadcasts. And in that case, if you are literally just doing information sharing, um, plan to be entertaining. Because what we found, and, and you can see this in the research also on teaching, is that you get about 10 minutes before people pass out if you're not also telling stories or doing something else. Very difficult. Um, one of the reasons we're doing webinars so often is that it's just, it's a really hard thing to get right. So um, there are a lot of companies where they do information sharing as a CYA, basically a way to make sure that uh, everybody has seen the information so that they know that they've transmitted it, but it is, it's not effective. It's terribly expensive definitely pursue something like uh, email, um, chat, Slack, other kinds of records, send that information in advance, and then, and then use your meeting time to address questions or comments. Um, one thing I mentioned earlier on this front is uh, Amazon's no PowerPoint rule, and it was explicitly to get at this problem. So what they do instead is they write a six page document, full sentences, full paragraphs, and they know people aren't gonna read this stuff before the meeting. So they take these and they hand them to folks as they walk in the meeting. Hmm. And people read the documents together in real time in silence and then they discuss it. But nobody reads to anybody else like they're kindergartners. Makes sense. Okay, we have another one um, from Cindy. She asks, uh, do you have any ideas for getting better pre-meeting engagement? That might've been a good answer to what you just gave. Um, or pr like pre-reads or on their own brainstorming in advance. Some of it has to do with um, expectation. 
right? So setting and meeting expectation. If you get the expectation that the reading will be done in advance and the brainstorming is done in advance, and then the meeting is stated as something where you're gonna show up and you're gonna start putting that stuff to work right away, and that's actually what you do, that's very, very educational. People do tend to then start to do the work in advance. The other critical piece there is that you don't, you don't go back and read it to them, right? Um, I have also seen it be effective in some companies where the pre-work isn't done, that they just stop. They say, okay, it looks like we're not ready. Let's, let's cancel this and reschedule for another hour. So those are kind of harder, more draconian approaches. I really am very excited about things that treat people as responsible adults and, and welcome their input and their genius. So um, in terms of brainstorming very specifically, I love tools like Storms, um, meeting sphere, you know, uh, group map, all of these are ways that people can brainstorm asynchronously in advance. They look like online sticky notes. They also make um, way easier reports. So if you're somebody who has to facilitate and they put the sticky notes on the wall and then you've got to type all that up, look into those kinds of tools much, much better. Um, and frankly, something as simple as a Google Doc, a OneNote document can also work as long as they're co-creating that can be a really fabulous way to do it. Okay. okay, we have a question from Deanna. She says, uh, I've seen situations where monthly report out meetings are held for the sake of holding accountability. How do you encourage the engagement or participation in the conversation to have a positive impact instead of a negative impact? Yeah, accountability. accountability. <laughs> Accountability is a challenge because accountability is, um, it is something we need, right? So the, the, if, if you look at the, t the cadence meetings, so these are the meetings that we use to, um, we've got a plan, we've got something we're trying to achieve and we want to make sure that keeps going. And their job is to both keep that work going, so that's accountability, but their job is also to build camaraderie. Their job is also to make our teams connected and stronger. So one of the ways that you can help the accountability be more successful is to, also, to make sure that it's balanced with the camaraderie. A lot of the rituals that we just talked about, the, the coffee tasting rituals, the icebreakers, in Zingerman's, all of their meetings are bookended. So they begin with an icebreaker. Then they discuss their victories, and this is similar to uh, a model that we teach. So you celebrate, you celebrate right up front. And then you do your accountability. Where are our numbers? Where are we short? What are we gonna do about it? How do we solve these problems? You make it very proactive. If something is out of touch on the accountability front, you can use that as an opportunity to get that group working together to solve that, as opposed to an opportunity for finger pointing, blaming, shaming, it's not really particularly productive. Solutions, on the other hand, rock. <laughs> and then after you've gone through, you've looked at where you're at, you've solved some problems. Zingerman's, and I think a lot of other companies who are really on top of their game, they end with appreciations. And it's this moment where people get to individually acknowledge something that they appreciate that someone has either done for them in the previous week or in that meeting. So it ends on this very wonderful, rich life affirming note it's very energizing and it also um does this nice job of putting a cap on the meeting so that people are like really ready to be done and get back to work <laughs> so so i i think there is a way to do it but the accountability does have to come up but it needs to be balanced with camaraderie okay uh and andrew says accountability is often heard as uh-oh i'm probably in trouble have you seen the impact of better meetings leading to a better culture in which people are less scared of failure? In other words, that failure becomes learning. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I saw that transition happen in an engineering team I worked on where we adopted Agile. And Agile's uh, a system, if you're not familiar with it, for deciding what you're gonna work on and then managing that work to completion and one of the practices, um, well, at all of the Agile practices are very centered on a very well-defined specific meeting flow model, which includes regular retrospectives. 
And when you do regular retrospectives or postmortems, those meetings are explicitly about learning from failure, right? The, um, actually, the military does a really great job of this well as well. Not everybody in the military, but some really high performing areas in the military, they're fabulous about looking at um, how do we learn from the failures we just had and how do we use that learning to make sure we don't fail in the future going forward. Um, and in the engineering team that I worked in, it was um, acrimonious to begin with. They were <clears throat> unpleasant to work with, <laughs> I think. Uh, I think Trisha was there at the time, so she knows exactly what I'm talking about. I was there, yeah. Uh, yep, and while they weren't necessarily nice to sales after that, they were definitely better to each other. There was a lot more beer, and there was a lot more product shipped, and that mm -hmm. was key. So they became more accountable, they became, and they became better at their jobs. Yeah, uh, and Andrew says that he laughed. He said, perfect answer. I was fishing for that. Shameless me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do have a couple questions around, um, Deanna, Deanna asks, which virtual brainstorming tools do you recommend? And then Magina also said, um, what is storms? So Deanna says, I heard you mention a few, but only noted a couple. So talking about virtual brainstorming tools, um, just virtual tools in general. So what I recommend for this, Tricia, if you have a moment, um, if you could find the blog article. So we, I wrote a blog post uh, three, four years ago, maybe three, mm -hmm. uh, about mm -hmm. different, looking specifically at this question because Lucid Meetings, um, our software platform uh, is possible to use that way, but it's not really what we're designed to do. So we had some templates we were putting together that had brainstorming activities in them. And I wanted to figure out who how to integrate with something that would work well for our clients. So I um, did a test and I went and I tested everything I could find and uh, wrote up all of those answers. Now my top, top choices are storms because they integrate with lucid meetings and that's what I use, right? So a lot of the time your top choice will be something you can use, something that works in your environment. Um, for other people, their top choice was Google Docs. Um, it's not brilliant or sexy, but you know what? You have it and it works. Um, there are some other tools on that list that are fabulous. Power Noodle is really cool. Meeting Sphere is really cool. Group Maps is really cool. So Mural, Mural is super cool. Uh, we did a webinar about a month ago with, uh, and the recording for that is available online so you can see what Storms looks like in action and some mm -hmm. others. And we'll be doing another one in February where we'll be showing Meeting Sphere, Mural, and one other secret participant that I haven't figured out yet. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Uh, it looks like that is most of our questions. <clears throat> I don't see any more. Please let us know if you have more questions. Uh, I have just noticed that the book is on sale. So I want to mention that uh, it's uh, for on Amazon. <laughs> from us? I'm, oh, yeah. from no, Amazon. On, on the, yeah, we have no book. control over that. So take yeah. advantage of it when you want, because who knows what they'll do, right? Uh, I'm seeing <laughs> here. I'm going to put it in the um, in the chat, and here's the name of this the book plus the the special. It looks like it's twenty dollars and forty one cents right now, down from twenty eight dollars. And they also say save five dollars on orders of twenty dollars or more. So it's actually oh. down to about fifteen bucks right now. Right, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see it. Jeez, jeez, but only till December first. So that's a couple of days. All right. Well, let's wrap up then. Yes. So I, I, I know that um, most people know us for our software. And one of the other questions that I often get, however, is um, do we do any work one-on-one -on -one with clients to help them improve their meetings? Now, as I think probably is obvious by now, the answer to that is yes. And for each of those engagements, we start with a one-hour quick start call. It's not a sales call. It's just an opportunity for you and I to talk about what's going on in your meetings see how we might just give you some free advice and free resources that can help you start making a change right away and then decide if we want to do anything further with that. So I'll be following up with everyone who attended by email 
There'll be a link in there. If you are interested in that, let me know. I only do one a week. So if you um, would love to have a free call and, and talk about what's going on for you, uh, let me know soon so that we can get you onto the schedule. Now, I know that you probably don't have time blocked off on your calendar for fixing meetings quite in the same way that I do. Um, because I meet a lot of smart, capable leaders and they've been meeting their whole lives and they figure, you know, uh, I know how to do this basically. And yeah, it would be great to have a meeting operating system, but you know, how hard could it be? How bad could it be if I don't, you know, um, what's the rush? I told you about Sally. We got a call from Sally last month and uh, her business is not doing great. Her best project lead quit. Her executive team is at each other's throats. And uh, you know, she knows because when she came to us, she was looking just for an agenda for her project meeting. And we're like, it's probably not enough. You probably need to deal with your meeting operating system. And she was like, no, 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 I'll get to that when I have time, I'm too busy. Didn't deal with it, but now she knows that not having an effective way to talk through their work may be costing her her business. Yep. Now, hopefully that's not your case. Hopefully your teams are not in open warfare, but I do know that if you don't already have a system like this in place, you're probably also not operating at a world-class level either. So I want you to picture uh, what that might be like. You know, picture a day where you never have to ask people to put away their cell phones because they all want to be there. You know, picture a day where you know that you're going to walk out of your meetings with a decision and that the people in that meeting are going to be committed to actually carrying out any tasks that they decided on. Picture a day where your meetings energize your team and help them connect and get excited about pursuing your goals together and making your mission a reality. So one last story before we wrap up. My very clean mother retired in her late 60s. Um, she's gonna be 70 here pretty soon, but her husband is still working. So she had a lot of time on her hands and she got stuck in a routine. You know, she did some volunteering and she cleaned and she uh, did some remodeling, and she cleaned, and she cooked, and she cleaned, until one day she looked up and she realized that she had scrubbed the grout out of the tile in that grubby bathroom <laughs> so that when they took a shower, the water was going through the tile, hitting the drywall, and then like seeping down to the floor below. So she did something that totally blew my mind. She and her husband sold that house. They bought a nappy, run-down, five-acre sheep farm 45 minutes from my house, which she is now happily remodeling. The farm is growing. The old ranch farmhouse is now gorgeous. And they're having a blast. So that's my wish for you. Not the sheep farm. We all get stuck in a routine, especially when it comes to meetings. We do what we saw our first boss do and we get stuck in business as usual. We let our calendars run us and we don't stop to consider whether our meetings are working for us. We don't stop to consider if there could be a better way. My wish for you is that you can take what you've learned here today, take this opportunity to get out of your business as usual routine and remodel your meetings. Remodel them into something that works for you, that works for your business so that you can grow and so that you and your team can have a blast. Thank you so much for coming today. Thanks, everyone. We'll look forward to following up with you later.
Yes, look for an email from Elise. She'll be sending you one. Appreciate that from everyone. We had a couple anecdotes. I'll just say them. Our virtual team is so aligned, our accountability is a ritual. Have you been faithful to your team assignments since our last meeting? And you either answer yes or no. So I think that's really cool. That was from Sunny. And uh, there are a couple other people just making comments. So fantastic. Thank you, everybody. We're going to end on time today. Appreciate your joining us and uh, hope to talk to you again very, very soon. Bye-bye.